Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. So as always, I'm going to go through and check out uh, my tabs. I'm going to start by reading the blurb, and then we'll get to the tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Nora's life has been going from bad to worse. Then, at the stroke of midnight on her last day on Earth, she finds herself transported to a library. There, she is given the chance to undo her regrets and try out each of the other lives she might have lived. Which raises the ultimate question. With infinite choices, what is the best way to live? So, with infinite tabs, let's go in and get started. So, this was published in 2020, um, and I think it tell, you can tell that from the dedication, which very much harkens back to, to COVID. Uh, to all the health workers and the care workers, thank you. And it's kicked off with a quote by Sylvia Plath here, which I wanted to read out. I can never be all the people I want and live all the lives I want. I can never train myself in all the skills I want. And why do I want? I want to live and feel all the shades, tones and variations of mental and physical experiences possible in my life. Yeah, we all do, but you have to choose, you have to make choices. So we start off with our main character, uh, Nora. She's chatting to um, a guy who once asked her out for coffee. Uh, he's out running and, she sa and he says, I'm doing the Bedford half, it's this Sunday. Oh, right, great. I was thinking of doing a half marathon and then I remembered I hate running, um, which is quite cute. But also I happened to read this at a time in which I was getting into running, so that was kind of fun as well. We get this little one-two, which is very true. I know you got mental health stuff. Everyone's got mental health stuff. And um, she's working in this music shop and the owner goes, I feel like you're made for better things. You're in your late 30s. I'm 35. Again, something I related to because I am 34 and a half. And he's talking to her about her childhood. She used to be a swimmer, um, which comes up later in the novel. Um, and she says, it was a lot of pressure. Pressure makes us though. You start off as coal and the pressure makes you a diamond. She didn't correct his knowledge of diamonds. She didn't tell him that while coal and diamonds are both carbon, coal is too impure to be able, under whatever pressure, to become a diamond. According to science, you start off as coal and you end up as coal. Maybe that was the real life lesson. So we have this short section, to live is to suffer. And just, you know, there's some real deep kind of almost philosophy to this book. The universe tended towards chaos and entropy. That was basic thermodynamics. Maybe it was basic existence too. You lose your job, then more shit happens. The wind whispered through the trees. It began to rain. She's thinking that maybe she's really crap at life. She wants to have a purpose, something to give her a reason to exist, but she has nothing. She tried to give a homeless man some money, but realised she had no money. Cheer up, love, it might never happen, someone said. Nothing ever did, she thought to herself. That was the whole problem. People used to say that to me on buses all the time. Cheer up, love, love it'll never happen. And so she ends up in the Midnight Library um, after a suicide attempt, essentially. Um, she sees Mrs Elm, who was the librarian at her old school library, and Mrs. Elm, she says, between life and death there is a library, and within that library the shelves go on forever. Every book provides a chance to try another life you could have lived, to see how things would be different if you'd made other choices. Would you have done anything different if you had the chance to undo your regrets? And obviously that's the big question, that's kind of the theme of this novel, but, you know, try asking yourself that question, it's a toughie to try and answer. And Mrs. Elm has the great line, tissues are like lives, there are always more. And she's thinking about when she got an offer to, uh, to, to get married to a guy called Dam. Uh, deep down she was scared of becoming a mother. She didn't want to replicate her parents' marriage. Still staring blankly at the book of regret, she wondered if her parents had ever been in love or if they'd got married because marriage was something you did at the appropriate time with the nearest available person. A game where you grabbed the first person you could find when the music stopped. She'd never wanted to play that game. Bertrand Russell wrote that to fear love is to fear life and those who fear life are already three parts dead. Maybe that was her problem. Maybe she was just scared of living, but Bertrand Russell had more marriages and affairs than hot dinners, so perhaps he was not one to give advice. So anyway, she goes, uh, she picks up one of these books, because that's how you kind of travel from the library into the various different lives, different, different potentials you might have had. Um, and she discovers that in this life, uh, she put four exclamation marks in a row. That was probably what happier, less uptight people did. And she's thinking about how when you're in a relationship you have to put up with the, the flaws of the other person we've all got flaws uh, and it says a person was like a city you couldn't let a few less desirable parts put you off the whole there may be bits you don't like a few dodgy side streets and suburbs but the good stuff makes it worthwhile and she's trying to remember what dan's voice had sounded like before um whether it's different in this life um she it says 
It was hard to remember exactly what he had sounded like before, what he'd been like precisely, but that was the nature of memory. A university she'd done an essay dryly titled The Principles of Hobbesian Memory and Imagination. Thomas Hobbes had viewed memory and imagination as pretty much the same thing, and since discovering that she had never entirely trusted her memories. And we learn how the Midnight Library works, because um, she says, There must be other lives in which I died before today. And Mrs. Elm says, you have died an infinite number of times before today, yes. Car accident, drug overdose, drowning, about fatal food poisoning, choking on an apple, choking on a cookie, choking on a vegan hot dog, choking on a non-vegan hot dog, every illness it was possible for you to catch or contract. You have died in every way you can, at any time you could. So I could open a book and just die. No, not instantaneously. As with Voltaire, the only lives available here are, well, lives. I mean, you could die in that life, but you won't have died before you enter the life, because this midnight library is not one of ghosts. It is not a library of corpses. It is a library of possibility, and death is the opposite of possibility. Which I suppose it is, yeah. We get a reference to uh, Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, because she's uh, into her philosophy as well. And Mrs. Elm points out that you can make good choices, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good outcome. Choices and outcomes are very different things. Uh, she says, you can choose choices, but not outcomes. But I stand by what I said. It was a good choice. It just wasn't a desired outcome. And then Nora thinks about depression. Um, Fish were more like humans than most people think. Fish get depression. They'd done tests with zebrafish. They had a fish tank and they drew a horizontal line on the side of it, halfway down in marker pen. Depressed fish stayed below the line, but give those same fish Prozac and they go above the line. Fish get depressed when they have a lack of stimulation, a lack of everything, when they're just there floating in a tank that resembles nothing at all. Again, quite a lot of sort of deep li uh, lines here, so this one here. Maybe even suicide would have been too active. Maybe in some lives you just float around and expect nothing else and don't even try to change. Maybe that was most lives. And she's playing chess with Mrs. Elm in the uh, Midnight Library. Uh, and I've been playing a lot of chess on my phone. I've been playing um, really bad chess, which is interesting because it takes like the chess board, kind of randomizes the pieces, so it's not the usual layout. You might have three queens, you might have no queens, you might have, you know, whatever it is. So um, it, it's interesting to play that style of chess where you, you're kind of seeing the board and the pieces in a whole new light. But anyway, uh, Mrs. Elm, she says, The Rook is my favourite piece. It's the one that you think you don't have to watch out for. It is straightforward. You keep your eye on the Queen and the Knights and the Bishop because they are the sneaky ones. But it's the Rook that often gets you. The straightforward is never quite what it seems. Which is true, I suppose. So there's some talk about the advantages of different pets. Animals are good company. Cats are too disobedient, he said, sounding like the brother she remembered. Dogs know their place. Disobedience is the true foundation of liberty. The obedient must be slaves. And so in another life, Nora has followed her dreams of kind of um, become, protecting the environment, I suppose. And um, she's working in the Arctic um, and she's on watch for polar bears. Soon as you fired the flare cell, the eldest of the group, a beardless, sharp-featured man called Peter, who was the field leader and who spoke in a state of permanent fortissimo, Bang the pan with a ladle. Bang it like mad and scream. They have sensitive hearing. They're like cats. Nine times out of ten, the noise scares them off. And the other time out of ten, he nodded down at the rifle. You kill it, before it kills you. Nora wasn't the only one with a gun. They all had guns. They were armed scientists. Anyway, Peter laughed and Ingrid patted her back. I truly hope, said Ingrid, laughing raspily, you don't get eaten. I would miss you. So long as you aren't menstruating, you should be okay. Jesus, what? They can smell the blood from a mile away. And this was interesting because I'd just been watching something about Dunbar's number as well. I've come across it elsewhere. Um, but it was just the timing of this. And also this is quite a, a relevant kind of discussion to have anyway in the age of, sort of social media connectivity. Um, Ash, who's the doctor, who in one of the lives he asked her out for a coffee. He'd said something about not over-googling health symptoms, and that had led to them talking about social media. He believed that the more people were connected on social media, the lonelier society became. That's why everyone hates each other nowadays, he reckoned, because they're overloaded with non-friend friends. Ever heard about Dunbar's number? And then he told her about a man called Robin Dunbar at Oxford University, who had discovered that human beings were wired to know only 150 people, as that was the average size of a hunter-gatherer community. And the Doomsday Book, Asher told her, under the stark lighting of the hospital canteen. If you look at the Doomsday Book, the average size of an English community at that time was 150 people. Except in Kent, where it was 100 people. I'm from Kent. We have antisocial DNA. I've been to Kent, Nora had countered. I noticed that. But I like that theory. I can meet that many people on Instagram in an hour. Exactly, not healthy, our brains can't handle it. And um, 
She's kind of enjoying life, but it says, This life is an intense one without compromise. It was currently minus 17 degrees, and she had nearly been eaten by a polar bear. And yet maybe the problem with her root life had partly been its blandness. She'd come to imagine mediocrity and disappointment were her destiny. And then they end up in uh, Longyearbyen, which is Norway's and the world's most northern town, with a population of around 2,000 people. And um, here we get some more of her philosophy. The life of a human, according to the Scottish philosopher David Hume, was of no greater importance to the universe than that of an oyster. But if it was important enough for David Hume to write that thought down, then maybe it was important enough to aim to do something good, to help preserve life in all its forms. And she's thinking about how, why she sees the Midnight Library. She actually meets somebody else who's between lives a bit like her, and he sees it as like a video rental store. She knew that everything humans see is a simplification. A human sees the world in three dimensions. That is a simplification. Humans are fundamentally limited, generalizing creatures, living on autopilot, who straighten out curved streets in their minds, which explains why they get lost all the time. It's like how humans never see the second hand of a clock mid-tick, said Nora. What? She saw that Hugo's watch was of the analog variety. Try it, you just can't. Minds can't see what they can't handle. And that's true, I suppose we don't. Weirdly though, you can, at least on some clocks, like I know on my downstairs one, when it ticks, because it doesn't, it depends whether it's a clock that just, you know, glides through the, uh, the, you know, the, through the 360 degrees or whatever, or if it's one that actually ticks. Because the ones that tick, you do sometimes see them go tick, and then you don't see the movement, but you see them vibrate after they've moved and they've come to a stop. Nice, interesting little soliloquy here. She explained the problem she'd had last time with transferring back. Oh yeah, well that might be bad, but it might not be. You do realise there are infinite possibilities here. I mean, the multiverse isn't ju about just some universes. It's not about a handful of universes. It's not even about a lot of universes. It's not about a million or a billion or a trillion universes. It's about an infinite number of universes, even with you in them. You could be you in any version of the world, however unlikely that world would be. You are only limited by your imagination. You can be very creative with the regrets you want to undo. I once undid a regret about not doing something I'd contemplated as a teenager, doing aerospace engineering and becoming an astronaut and so in one life I became an astronaut. I haven't been to space but I became someone who had been there for a little while. The thing you have to remember is that this is an opportunity and it is rare and we can undo any mistake we made, live any life we want, any life, dream big, you can be anything you want to be because in one life you are. She sipped her coffee, I understand. But you will never live if you are looking for the meaning of life, he said wisely. You're quoting Camus. You got me. And then, so in another version of her life, she is uh, the pop, a pop star or a rock star, I guess, the front woman of uh, the band playing her songs. Um, and she's playing in front of an audience and she closes her eyes and vows not to open them until she's finished playing. She understood why Chopin had liked playing in the dark so much. It was so much easier that way. And um, so she goes on um, to make a, not quite a speech, she's being interviewed while she is this, um, you know, famous rock star. And she says, There are patterns to life, rhythms. It is so easy while trapped in just the one life to imagine that times of sadness or tragedy or failure or fear are a result of that particular existence. That it is a byproduct of living a certain way rather than simply living. I mean, it would have made things a lot easier if we understood there was no way of living that can immunize you against sadness. And that sadness is intrinsically part of the fabric of happiness. You can't have one without the other. Of course, they come in different degrees and quantities, but there is no life where you can just be in a state of sheer happiness forever. And imagine there is, it just breeds more unhappiness in the life you're in. All right, then we have the lyrics to her song, Howl. I'm not going to read them out here to you. Um, I've tabbed these out because we have a similar problem here that I, found, I find in basically any book in which an author is writing lyrics or like it happened in On The Come Up when Angie Thomas was writing uh, like uh, rap bars. It just doesn't come across as genuine to me. I don't know why, it just doesn't. So anyway, Nora goes back to the Midnight Library and we get, I hate this process, Nora told Mrs. Elm with real force in her voice. I want it to stop. Please be quiet, said Mrs. Elm with a white knight in her hand, concentrating on her move. This is a library. We're the only two people here. That's not the point. It is still a library. If you're in a cathedral, you are quiet because you're in a cathedral, not because other people are there. It's the same with a library. And she kind of realises the experiences, even the bad ones, are serving a purpose because they're teaching her that her regret are maybe misplaced, you know? You know, the regret that she had about um, running a pub with her, her, the well, not husband, but the guy who proposed to her. Uh, she didn't go ahead with a marriage. She, you know, she regretted not going ahead with a marriage and it turns out she wouldn't have been happy there. So the regret was misplaced. Although she regretted it there was no point in regretting it and um, so Mrs. Elm talks about the chessboard and she's kind of using this as a metaphor for life she says look at that chessboard we put back in place look at how ordered and safe and peaceful it looks now before a game starts it's a beautiful thing but it is boring it is dead 
And yet the moment you make a move on that board, things change. Things begin to get more chaotic, and that chaos builds with every single move you make. She took a seat at the chess table opposite Mrs. Elm. She stared down at the board and moved a pawn two spaces forward. Mrs. Elm mirrored the move on her side of the board. It is an easy game to play, she told Nora, but a hard one to master. Every move you make opens a whole new world of possibility. Nora moved one of her knights. They progressed like this for a little while. Mrs. Elm provided a commentary. At the beginning of a game, there are no variations. There is only one way to set up a board. There are 9 million variations after the first 6 moves. And after 8 moves, there are 288 billion different positions. And those possibilities keep growing. There are more possible ways to play a game of chess than the amount of atoms in the observable universe. So it gets very messy. And there is no right way to play. There are many ways. In chess, as in life, possibility is the basis of everything. Every hope, every dream, every regret, every moment of living. And this is sad, so she ends up going... Uh, going to a, an existence in which she worked with animals. Um, Nora wanted to live in a world where no cruelty existed, but the only worlds she had available to her were worlds with humans in them. That's really sad, but a very powerful line. We get some Bob Dylan and Leonard Cohen references, which I enjoyed because I'm a fan of both of them. Great piece of advice that we could all do to do with remembering. Never trust someone who is willingly rude to low paid service staff. And um, as she kind of experiences more and more of these lives, um, she realised that she hadn't tried to end her life because she was miserable, but because she had managed to convince herself that there was no way out of her misery. That, she supposed, was the basis of depression as well as the difference between fear and despair. Fear was when you wandered into a cellar and worried that the door would close shut. Despair was when the door closed and locked behind you. And we have this great little mini chapter called A Thing I Have Learned, written by a nobody who has been everybody. Um, I don't want to read you the full thing out, um, but I do want to read you a good half of it because I think it's really beautiful. It is easy to mourn the lives we aren't living. Easy to wish we'd developed other talent, said yes to different offers. Easy to wish we'd worked harder, loved better, handled our finances more astutely, been more popular, stayed in the band, gone to Australia, said yes to the coffee or done more bloody yoga. It takes no effort to miss the friends we didn't make and the work we didn't do and the people we didn't marry and the children we didn't have. It is not difficult to see yourself through the lens of other people and to wish you were all the different kaleidoscopic versions of you they wanted you to be. It is easy to regret and keep regretting ad infinitum until our time runs out. But it is not the lives you regret not living that are the real problem. It is the regret itself. It's the regret that makes us shrivel and wither and feel like our own and other people's worst enemy. We can't tell if any of those other versions would have been better or worse. Those lies are happening, it is true, but you are happening as well, and that is the happening we have to focus on. Of course, we can't visit every place or meet every person or do every job, yet most of what we'd feel in any life is still available. We don't have to play every game to know what winning feels like. We don't have to hear every piece of music in the world to understand music. We don't have to have tried every variety of grape from every vineyard to know the pleasure of wine. Love and laughter and fear and pain are universal currencies. We just have to close our eyes and savour the taste of the drink in front of us and listen to the song as it plays. We are as completely and utterly alive as we are in any other life and have access to the same emotional spectrum. We only need to be one person. We only need to feel one existence. We don't have to do everything in order to be everything because we are already infinite. While we are alive, we always contain a future of multifarious possibility. And um, we get a reference to the anti-philosophy of Mrs. Elm. You don't have to understand life, you just have to live it. And so I'm gonna spoil the ending for you, but I do feel like it was quite predictable. It turns out that the perfect life for her is the one that she had tried to escape from. Um, and we get this just at the end that I want to share with you. It is quite a revelation to discover that the place you wanted to escape to is the exact same place you escaped from. That the prison wasn't the place but the perspective. And the most peculiar discovery Nora made was of all the extremely divergent variations of herself she had experienced, the most radical sense of change happened within the exact same life. The one she began and ended with. She realises there are other scales and other tunes. She had felt other things before and she would feel other things again. Sometimes simultaneously. Yes, there may be a bass drum of despair. But there were other instruments at her disposal too. And they could play at the same time. Which is a beautiful little music uh, metaphor. But also she used to work in a music shop. Obviously she is quite musical. So, so that was quite cool. And actually it shows how... Obviously, the big kind of theme here is how the decisions we make have implications, a bit like the butterfly effect, and how you can make the right decision but still have the wrong outcome. Um, and kind of coming to terms with the fact that the life we live now is the result of all of these decisions we've made. Um, 
and we are who we are because we made those decisions, you know. Um, but also it shows how like multifaceted people can be. So yes, she is a champion swim swimmer. She's uh, an incredibly um, incredible musician. She is, uh, you know, a, I've forgotten the word, not a geologist, but she knows about ice formation and global warming and shit. So in each of these different lives, she has all these different potentials and it just shows that, you know, very few human beings are born for one thing only. You know, even Mozart, I'm sure Mozart in another life, he could have been a very good bricklayer, you know? So yes, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, probably a 4.5 out of 5 from me. Um, I did enjoy it a lot. Very well written, very philosophical, which uh, Nora would like as a fan of philosophy herself. And probably one of the better Matt Haig books that I've read so far. And I love the fact as well, there's a mention of a cat in this. Uh, Matt Haig seems to be a cat man, which is, which is fine by me. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I made of The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.